song. Come sing a new song with us. The reading today is from Psalms chapter 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither and all that they do, they prosper. Word of God, word of life. Thank you, God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter called and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Morning, new song. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see uh, some uh, new faces, uh, faces that are coming back. Uh, uh, it's great to see everybody. How many people have gotten their uh, COVID shot? Uh, raise your hand. Wow. Oh, nice. I, I haven't raised my hand yet. I don't know. When, do, when am I eligible? I don't know. <laughs> we're continuing our Lenten uh, journey, Purple Theory, and today we're talking about Scripture, and so I thought I would, uh, I grabbed a couple of Bibles that have been shared with me over the years when I, um, there's a delightful lady named Pat Frankie, and she moved back to Illinois not long ago, and she gave me uh, this little Bible here. It's actually the New Testament and Psalms. And uh, Chris, can you read those for me? No? No. The words are kind of small. Although, uh, and then Liz Baldazon shared this comeback from uh, North Dakota. This is the opposite size. Huge Bible, right? Uh, I think it was printed in the 1800s. And it's got, it's actually in really good condition too. Uh, it's got all the Bible, and then it's got a huge section in the beginning. It's got its own Bible dictionary, and then these wonderful uh, pictures along with it. Maybe some of I I'm, I'm, imagine this was maybe a Bible salesman going door to door, sold this Bible many, many years ago. Uh, quite interesting, the different ways that we can read the Bible, right? There's all sorts of different translations. There's all different uh, sizes of Bibles, study Bibles. Um, they, call, they come in all shapes and sizes. I remember when I first came to the men's Bible study uh, a few years ago, and most of the men were, they didn't bring a Bible, they opened it up on their telephone. That was kind of an op eye-opening experience for me. Um, now I have the, the Bible app on my own phone. As we start to think about Bible um, and our two stories for today, I'd like to start with a spiritual song. Um, it's not a contemporary song, it's, a, it, it's in the con category of traditional song. Is that okay? Uh, okay, I get a little permission. Uh, it was, this song emerged in the underground churches in the American South during a time of slavery, and the words and the melody will be familiar, uh, but those who wrote and sang it first, those names have long been lost. But the song goes like this. I shall not, I shall not be moved. I shall not, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved. Fighting sin and Satan, I shall not be moved. Fighting sin and Satan, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. You may be asked to sing that a little bit later, so keep it in your mind. The reason I uh, conjure this song up is that the spiritual song connects quite seamlessly our two readings for today. Um, and the imagery is quite vivid. First of all, we have this phrase, fighting sin and Satan. It's very stark, it's very aggressive, it's very adversarial. Um, but that's exactly what happens in the story. It's a reference in, in a way to our uh, story of Jesus in the wilderness battling Satan. After 40 days of fasting, 
of being dehydrated, parched, hungry. It is at the very end in the Gospel of Matthew that Satan, uh, I love how uh, you read the, you miss, said the word uh, came, but you said Satan called on Jesus, which actually is right. It's beautiful. Jesus, at the very uh, moment of weakest, weakness, Satan knocks on the door and he calls on Jesus uh, for a little visit. But it's a, a very harsh adversarial visit that will uh, begin this battle and Satan trying to begin his work. And if we think about what is the function of Satan, what is his job, the essence is to be a tempter, to tempt. His temptation specifically will be to try to uh, nip this thing in the bud, the kingdom of God having come near into the world, having come into the world with the incarnation, and Jesus about to begin his ministry of sharing the gospel for all people, especially those who are on the margins and weak and suffering. Satan doesn't want any part of it, and he wants to destroy it from the get-go before Jesus heals a single person. And so he begins this battle and this temptation of Christ in the wilderness, in the desert. It's a starkly contrasting image than what we get in our first reading, which is the first psalm, and, and they're very wise. You know what they call the first psalm? They call it Psalm 1. <laughs> that was a joke, Chris. You've got to just humor me and laugh. <laughs> um, in Psalm 1, we get the image of a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved, just like a tree that's planted by the water. The reference is from Psalm 1, and uh, we get from Psalm 1, we get this beautiful image that says, Happy are those whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, and they will yield their fruit in due season. And all that they do in prop is, pro is proper, prosper. And you can imagine, picture just for a moment, close your eyes, and I want you to uh, paint, Jenny, in your mind, paint a tree, and then alongside it, plant, uh, let a river grow uh, and flow right by that tree. And we know that tree will always have the resources and the nutrients it needs to flourish and to grow. It will never it will never go dry. It will never uh, run out of water to, to nourish itself. It's a little bit different than what we do here in Vegas. Have you ever stood on top of a hill in Henderson and looked out over the valley? If you just kind of look really quickly, you would never know that you were in a desert, right? We don't plant our trees by streams of water, do we? We plant them uh, far, far, far from a stream of water, and then we figure out, okay, how are we can get that water to my tree? <laughs> we go to great lengths to bring the water to the trees so that they can grow. And on occasion, we get in trouble by that. Shani uh, let me know a few months ago that, uh, well, we had this little water leak. It didn't turn out to be that little of a water leak. And do you know what the water bill was for that month? Toby, take a guess. Take a guess. $2,000. All because we were trying to get that water from somewhere else from Lake Mead over to our trees. I'm assured that it's been fixed. Has it been fixed? Okay, so it's back down again. Um, but isn't that a little bit like most of us in Las Vegas, right? I, I have to ask this. Was anybody born or raised in Las Vegas? Toby, we got one. Anybody else? So thank you for sharing the city with the rest of us. Uh, the rest of us moved here, and often when we uh, uproot ourselves, we've uprooted ourselves from our church, from our family, from our social network, and we find ourselves out in the desert, in the wilderness, um, a little bit like those trees, desperate for water. And to be clear, when the psalm says, happy are those whose delight is in the law of the Lord, they're not just talking about the Ten Commandments, but uh, in that language in the psalms, the law is referring to the Torah which another word for that is Bible. So happy are those whose delight is in the scriptures, for they are like trees planted by streams of water, and they will be continually nourished throughout their lives. There are lots of different names for scriptures that we see in, scripture, in the Bible. 
Um, there's the Word of God, the living Word of God. We call it the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, the law, the Hebrew Scriptures, and the Gospel, the good news of Jesus. The Word of Life is actually scriptural. And the most vivid image that I found is, comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Do you know what the Bible is referred to in this place? Scripture is called the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. Let that image sink in that the Bible, the Scripture, is a sword. That's a very aggressive, almost uh, has connotations of violence. But in another way, it is true because the sword can be both offensive and defensive to uh, deal with the dangers when we find ourselves in our own wilderness places, when we feel like we are the tree that's not planted by the water but far away in desperate need, just as Jesus was battling with Satan, right? Uh, it turns out that Satan is really, he mounted his serious assault against Christ and he had all the arms of temptation trying to undermine the mission of Christ, which is the way of the cross, the way of suffering, sacrificial love for all of the world. And Christ only defends himself with one tool, and that's Scripture. The most immediate, urgent need that Jesus has, of course, is the hunger, that uh, pangs that he has through fasting. This is not the 16, 8-hour intermittent fasting. This is a 40-day fasting. And Jesus, uh, Satan says immediately, turn these breads into stone, feed yourself. If you're hungry, go ahead. You can do it. And Jesus' response is what? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Was Jesus very poetic? Was that a, a great insight that Jesus had? Actually, he's quoting Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 3. Satan continues uh, to tempt him. Now he takes him up to the top of the temple in Jerusalem, having him say, throw yourself down from here and you can save yourself if you, th if you think you're the Son of God. Jesus responds again, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, the sword of the Spirit. And then finally, Satan takes Jesus and looks out as we could look out over the valley and says, you can have it all. I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. If you came in to be the king of the world, I can give it to you right now. Just one thing, bow down and worship me, the tempter. Jesus responds, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. The sword of the Spirit. The Scripture gives us strength and power to deal with a whole host of dangers and challenges that we face in our lives. And with that moment, the devil is defeated. <clears throat> but even as it is the sword of the Spirit and we know that it has power, Maybe sometimes, can't the Bible seem a little hard to read, not just because of the little letters, right? Maybe the Bible can be too small, the fine print too small, or maybe it can be very huge and intimidating and a little, can we get a little afraid of the Bible sometimes? I began teaching again our confirmation class, our middle school uh, kids. Um, if you were to... If I were to put you in charge of the confirmation class, how would you teach the Bible? How would you go about doing it? It is kind of hard to understand, right? It was written a uh, long, long ago in a different language, not just one language, but two different languages. There's 66 books in the Bible. Um, it's got numerous translations. It's... Um, hard to understand. Sometimes we read things that sound kind of weird. Maybe some of you thought the pastor was talking about this dude that was married to one person and then, well, no, then he was married to another person, then he was having kids with that person, then other kids with that person. Uh, that's kind of weird, right? Sometimes maybe you read something in the Bible and you're not sure you agree with it. Maybe you look through and you see uh, violence and battles Sometimes you wonder about the miracles, and sometimes you think maybe the Bible is written for somebody else, but not for me. That is, in a sense, a modern view of Scripture, right? 
and as we let those doubts and those questions come into our hearts, we become a little bit like the tree that walks away from the river. And we can't be nourished by it. And yet the questions are real. I think in some ways the Bible can be kind of like the oven that's in our kitchen. How many of you have been in our kitchen? Uh, we have a wonderful kitchen. It's very fabulous. And what I've been told is that we actually, you don't know this, but we have the Cadillac of ovens. It is told to me that it is by far the best oven that you can possibly get. It has uh, lots and lots of racks and layers. It's got so many functions that would blow your mind. You would be amazed at the ability of this oven to do what it wants to do. One thing, I have no idea how to use it at all. It is utterly confusing and confounding. If you go there, one time we had a men's Bible study, and I think there were four of us standing around the oven as if though it was like written in Sanskrit, and we're kind of looking at it like, and we did everything we could to try to get this thing to work, and we just finally threw in the towel and we quit. We just couldn't get the thing to work. Can that be what Scripture is like? It is true. The Bible was written long ago and far away. In fact, its composition probably took over 1,500 years. 1,500 years. And if you think about it, even within the life of the Bible itself, the world had changed so much. Imagine how much the world had changed when Abraham and Sarah were wandering around Cana, meandering, nomadic life. How much had the world changed when Jesus would come into the world during the time of the Roman Empire, when the technologies of the day were the newest and the roads were paved and the Rome had, uh, it, the world had changed dramatically. And yet, that word continued to speak throughout the generations and gave Jesus power to battle against the devil. It didn't stop speaking then when it was completed, but that word continued to speak through the generations. If Scripture were a dead word, if its meaning had been completed and we read it like a historical text, it would have ceased to give life and love and healing to the world. But that scripture continued to speak and continued to hand down from generation to generation to us today. And it is truly a gift. It is truly a river that will nourish you throughout your life. We just jump in. It doesn't matter where you start. Start in the Gospel of Mark. Start with the Psalms. Start with the book of Genesis. Start wherever you want. Just get in there. Read it by yourself, read it in a small group, and come here and read it together as the body of Christ here at New Song Church. I've been blessed to be able to experience Scripture in all five continents of the world. I've had Scripture read to me in India, in South America, in Africa, in Europe, and all over the United States. And in each community, the living word is a sword that gives life and power to those people. Last week, Shannon and I had the opportunity to meet with a man in his dying days, Chris Depper. He and his wife and his daughter and I and Shannon gathered in a hospital room, a hospice room. We didn't talk about sports. We didn't talk about the weather. We opened up an app and we read from the Gospel of John, and we heard the words, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And Chris and Sandy were able to be nourished by that stream, and that will continue to nourish Sandy as she begins this new process of grieving. We indeed are like trees planted by the water. I shall, sing with me, I shall not, I shall not be moved. I shall not, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. 
I shall not be moved.